Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're going to go back to project finance today and talk about two very important metrics and ratios, the debt service coverage ratio and the loan life coverage ratio. So for all the files and resources here, you'll want to go to our project finance page in our knowledge base. I'll link to it and pin the comment below this video. This is another summary or excerpt from our full project finance and infrastructure modeling course. Now with this one, we actually have two separate pages on the topic. We have one page for the DSCR, the debt service coverage ratio, and one for the LLCR, the loan life coverage ratio. And you can go to each of them and see the written versions and screenshots and some sample Excel files. So it's split up a little bit differently, but it's the same idea as usual. I'm gonna start with the short version and then go into some more details and talk about some added complexities to these metrics. So the debt service coverage ratio equals the cash flow available for debt service in one year divided by the debt service in that year. So if we pull up this very simple file that demonstrates debt sizing and sculpting and we look at the debt service coverage ratio, we take the cash flow available for debt service and then we divide by the total debt service. So the interest expense and then the scheduled amortization, which is sculpted in this case. And then we can copy it all the way over to the right. We get to the 1.5x number in each year. Now, the loan life coverage ratio is the present value of cash flow available for debt service in the remaining tenor of the debt divided by the current debt balance. Let's use the NPV function right here. We'll enter 10% for the discount rate because that's the interest rate on this debt. And then we'll apply it to this range from year one through year 10. Now be very careful here because this debt tenor is 10 years. This model has 11 years. So we don't wanna get year 11, we just wanna get year one through year 10 right up here. And so I'll anchor the O part of the O18 to make sure we get that correct. We'll take this and then divide by the current debt balance right here. And I'll copy this over and I can just delete this one at the end. It no longer really applies there. Even the year 10 one shouldn't really be there. We should really be ending in year nine because year 10 is the last year of the debt service. And as you can see, in this case, the debt service coverage ratio and the loan life coverage ratio match each other. The cash flow available for debt service has different components, but at the minimum, it's usually EBITDA minus maintenance capex plus or minus the change in working capital minus cash taxes. You mostly use the debt service coverage ratio and the loan life coverage ratio to size and sculpt debt. And then you also use them to evaluate credit risk and loan covenants in deals. With the debt service coverage ratio, one important point is that it's based on only the scheduled debt service. So the interest payments and the required principal repayments that are sent in advance when the deal begins, when the loan is first issued. Now these could be sculpted or they could be based on percentages of the initial loan balance. But the point is that if there's some type of optional repayment here, you don't count that in this ratio. With the loan life coverage ratio, this includes cash flow available for debt service only in the debt's remaining tenor. So going back to that example that I just showed you here, a common mistake here would be to do something like this, would be to just take everything in the model going out to year 11, and then to say, okay, let's go do cell P18 here. And as you can see, we don't get the correct results. The loan life coverage ratio here is 1.61X because we are not considering only the cash flows for year one through year 10, we're actually extending it past that. So you see this all the time where people don't understand the difference in financial models. And so you get cases where the asset lasts for 20 years, the debt is only outstanding for 10 years, and yet they include all 20 years rather than just 10 years. And that's actually a different ratio, the project life coverage ratio or PLCR. Conceptually, the loan life coverage ratio is the present value version of the debt service coverage ratio over the debt's remaining tenor. And they're usually the same number if the debt is sized or sculpted based on one. But as I'll show you in a little bit, there are exceptions in cases where they diverge, especially as you go further into the holding period. So that's the short version. To go into more detail now, I will start by reviewing some basics around debt sculpting and sizing in the first part of this. Then we'll go through some additional items and complexities around these ratios. We'll talk about what to do with variable dates and discount rates. Then we'll go through multiple debt tranches and how you calculate the loan life coverage ratio there. And then we'll talk about the DSCR and LLCR in covenant analysis when looking at deals from the perspective of lenders. So the first main use case of the debt service coverage ratio is in sculpting and sizing debt. You could go through it and use the same method that I showed you in the debt sizing and sculpting tutorial where you project the cash flow available for debt service, you calculate the interest expense, the max debt service, and the max debt amortization each year, and then you back into the proper starting balance. Here, for example, let's say that we did not have the proper starting balance at all. 
And so let's say that everything here was zero initially. We could go in and say that the initial debt balance is 850. And then we could go to the end and say, okay, in year 10, we want this balance, the ending balance to be zero. So let's do a goal seek, alt A W G. We set this to zero. And then we do this by changing the initial debt balance cell right here. And that gives us a value of 800.9. And we're doing all this, we're doing the sculpting and determining the max debt amortization allowed all based on this minimum debt service coverage ratio of 1.5x. So that's one simple way you can use it. If you wanna make your model more flexible though, you'll want to use the loan life coverage ratio for debt sizing. And the idea here is that you can take the relationships and use some algebra to flip them around and to say that the debt balance is the present value of cash flow available for debt service in the debt tenor divided by the loan life coverage ratio. For example, here, we can take the present value of cash flow available for debt service over the debt tenor. We'll take the 10% interest rate, and then we will go to year 10, again, being very careful not to get year 11. And then the debt balance here will just be this present value number divided by the 1.5x loan life coverage ratio, and it's the same 800.9. And we also end with a zero balance in year 10. So that's the other way that you can use this. And I just lay out some of the numbers here. So these are the basics, and these are probably the most common use cases for the DSCR and LLCR in project finance and infrastructure models. Let's go to point number two and talk about some additional items and complexities. With both of these, you still run into issues with circular references because the interest expense affects the taxes, the taxes in the future affect the cash flow available for debt service, but the cash flow available for debt service affects the initial debt balance. So you can resolve this in different ways, in the debt sizing and sculpting tutorial, I explained how you can set up a very simple copy paste macro to resolve this. So that's certainly one method. Another method is that you could just use goal seek with the debt service coverage ratio, as I just showed you to get around it, but it's quite cumbersome in that case. And it gets rather annoying to keep updating the model whenever anything changes. With the definition of cash flow available for debt service, some other items could go into it. For example, you could see reserve allocations for natural resource deals, you could see items like hedging gains and losses and hedging costs. You could see something like decommissioning capex for certain types of assets that require extra spending when they go out of service. One point though, is that growth capex should never be there. So if you buy an airport and then you expand it by building a new terminal, that capex for the new terminal should not be part of this because usually for something like this, there will be a separate funding source. So there will be a separate debt or equity or combined debt and equity funding or something like that to fund this major expansion of the project. So that is one thing you have to be careful about. You can still look at these metrics on an overall basis, but normally you separate out something like that. One other point here is that the debt service coverage ratio and loan life coverage ratio are not always equal, even if you sculpt and size based on one of them. One common issue that causes distortions is if there are optional debt repayments, because in this case, it means the debt balance reduces by faster than expected. I'm gonna pull up this lithium mining model and go to the debt tab. And you can see right here that for the overall project, the targeted debt service coverage ratio here is 3X and it stays at that level, but the loan life coverage ratio starts at 3X and then rapidly goes up to a much higher level than that. And the reason this happens in this case is because we have something called a cash flow sweep on the initial debt used here. And since the asset is able to repay a lot of this debt early on, the debt balance goes down to a much lower level here. Now, obviously in a downside case, this wouldn't happen. So if lithium prices suddenly fall, you probably wouldn't see a cash flow sweep to this extent, much less debt would be repaid. But in base or optimistic cases, this type of thing is quite, quite common. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if the assets cash flow falls to a very low level and it can't even pay for its scheduled debt service, you could see cases there where the debt service coverage ratio falls below the minimum and falls below the loan life coverage ratio, but the loan life coverage ratio over the entire period still looks good, even if in one year or one quarter, the asset clearly cannot service its debt. One question we get a lot is what to do if you have variable dates or discount rates that change in a model like this. So for example, maybe you don't know exactly when the assets development will finish or when a planned acquisition will close, or you don't know exactly how long the debt will last. It could be five years or 10 years or 15 years, but you're not sure of the exact dates. The usual solution here is to use a system of flags that keep track of when the debt is outstanding and then calculate the present value of cash flow available for debt service in reverse order. 
So you can say that if the debt is outstanding in this current year, then the present value of cash flow available for debt service in the remaining debt tenor equals the cash flow available for debt service in this period, plus the present value of everything after this period through the debt tenor. And then you divide by one plus the debt interest rate in this period. So here is an example of this. I have this model here that lets you change the debt issuance year and the debt maturity year. And up at the top, we have this debt tenor flag. And it just says one if we're in the active period for the debt and zero otherwise. So if I change the debt issuance year here to two, and then I change the debt maturity year to seven, you can see that we get ones in several of the years, but not in everything. And then if you go down and look at how this works, essentially this works by starting from the end, from the final year and saying, okay, if in the next year after this, some debt is outstanding, let's take the cash flow available for debt service plus the present value of cash flow available for debt service for everything after that and divide by one plus the interest rate in that period. And that's the present value in this previous year. And then we keep working backwards like that until we get to the very start when the debt is initially issued. There are other ways you could set this up. For example, you could use the offset function in Excel or XNPV or other things like that. But I find this to be an easier and more straightforward way to do it. We also get questions about what to do if you have multiple debt tranches. Once again, you generally want to use a flag system with zeros or ones, depending on whether the debt is not outstanding or outstanding. The difference here is that when you have multiple debt tranches, you need to calculate the weighted average interest rate on all of them to look at the overall LLCR. Now, sizing and sculpting with multiple debt tranches gets more complicated, and we don't really have time to go into it now, but just to show you the calculation methods, if we have a first lien loan for 70% of the total, and then a second lien loan for 30% of the total, and they both have different interest rates. One has a 5% spread, one has a 7% spread. Then we have to calculate the weighted average interest rate first by taking the interest rate in each period and multiplying by the 30% plus the 70% for the other one. So we calculate that weighted average interest rate. And then when we calculate the present value of cash flow available for debt service, it's based on this weighted average interest rate and the fact that the debt is actually active in this period. But it's the same approach. We essentially work backwards. So we start at the very end in the final year, and then each year before that, we take that present value from that next year and the cash flow available for debt service in that year, and we divide by one plus that weighted average interest rate until we get to the present value of cash flow available for debt service starting at the very beginning when the debt is first issued. And once we have that, we can just use that and the loan life coverage ratio to back into the initial debt balance. And then one final point here is with covenant analysis. Oftentimes lenders will set some type of target DSCR or LLCR and they'll size the debt based on that. But at the same time, they'll also have some type of minimum DSCR or LLCR if the asset underperforms. So maybe they have a target of a 1.3x DSCR, but the minimum they wanna see is 1.1x. And if the asset falls below that level, they might have to take special actions or restrict the activities. Also, if something like this happens, it's a sign that the sponsor is probably using too much debt and they need to reduce the amount of debt used in the deal. So if the asset falls below this level, the lenders could impose penalty fees. They could restrict the assets activities. They could attempt to seize collateral. I have up here an airport model where something like this happens, where the real minimum debt service coverage ratio according to the covenants is around 1.1x. And in some periods, it's actually fine, but it's a little bit questionable. It falls below the 1.1x level in some cases. And this is just a base case scenario. So we know that in the downside case scenario, we're in trouble here. And so looking at this graph, the quick conclusion is that we probably need to use less debt. One common penalty or quasi penalty here is that there may be a cash trap that restricts the dividends to the equity investors if the asset falls out of compliance with these ratios. So going back to that airport model, if we take a look at the dividend line, which is shown on the cash flow statement here, in the formula, we're doing a check and we're checking to make sure that we actually comply with the minimum debt service coverage ratio here. And if we do, then we issue the available cash flow or percent of that available cash flow in the form of dividends. And this works in many of the years, but at a certain point, it stops working because we fall below that minimum debt service coverage ratio covenant. And so the equity investors do not get their dividends in all those years when we're out of compliance with this covenant. Let's do a quick recap and summary. 
We started by going over depth sculpting and sizing, how you use the DSCR and LLCR for those. In short, you can either use GoalSeek with the debt service coverage ratio or set it up in a smarter, more flexible way with the loan life coverage ratio and use some VBA code to get around circular references. With additional items and complexities, there is a little bit more to the cash flow available for debt service definition. Also, in some cases, the DSCR and LLC are not equivalent, especially if there are optional repayments or the asset's cash flow falls to a very low level at some point. With variable dates and discount rates, you wanna set up a system of flags and start at the end and then work your way forward, dividing the total in each year by one plus the discount rate in the relevant year until you get to the beginning. With multiple debt tranches, if you're trying to calculate these metrics, the main difference is that you need to use the weighted average interest rate on the debt tranches instead of just a single interest rate or discount rate. And then in covenant analysis, lenders often use the DSCR and LLCR to determine if the asset can actually issue dividends to the equity investors, if they're restricted from certain actions or certain activities, and if it gets bad enough, they could even potentially seize collateral. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about these key metrics and ratios used in project finance for debt sizing and sculpting, and also credit analysis and covenant analysis and deals.